What a fun little song that is. Man, I'm starting to really like that. I'm going to have to put that on my iPod. Um, one of the most famous speeches, uh, it was a soliloquy written by Shakespeare, is delivered in the play Hamlet. It's the speech sometimes just referred to, to be or not to be. Right? And it's this, this moment in the character Hamlet's development where he is considering how it is that he moves forward. Does he move forward in vengeance, even if it costs him his life? Or does he sort of let bygones be bygones? And he's sort of at this crucial moment. And one of the things that he considers is what are the ramifications or implications if he dies in, in this struggle. And as he's describing this, he has this one particular part of that speech where he says, where he talks about death. And he calls it this, he says, death, that undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, that it puzzles and it makes us rather bear those ills that we have than fly to others that we know not of. He says, we would rather take what we've got rather, right here than risk it by seeing what comes next. But eventually we will all see what comes next. So this morning we're going to talk about death. We're going to talk about what it is that happens to us after death. And along the way in talking about this, in fact, let me explain this. I'm going to go sort of in reverse order. I'm going to start with the most distant things and work backwards to that moment of death. And um, I want to give a biblical perspective to what happens when we die. There are a lot of perspectives out there. You can find a lot of information in places. You can find, you know, number one bestsellers like Heaven is for Real or 30 Minutes in Heaven or 7 Minutes in Hell. All of those are available on Amazon. I wouldn't recommend any of them. Um, but um, we, my goal today is to give a biblical perspective on what it is that happens when we die. And along the way, I'm going to address about five or six different questions that came in dealing with death and heaven and, and hell and resurrection and uh, even the, uh, the uh, Protestant Reformation along the way. So we're going to pick up a lot of those things as we move through. But today, uh, we're going to begin by talking about the idea of heaven and of hell. And, and I don't use that terminology very much. I don't talk about heaven and hell very much. I was brought up with, you know, H-E double hockey sticks. That was just something we didn't say a lot in polite conversation. And so, I, you know, maybe I was just holding on to a little bit of that. But um, heaven and hell are presented as these diametrically opposed uh, realities. And, um, and I, I don't, here's why I kind of shy away from using them. And it is because they're loaded with meaning. And a lot of our perspective on heaven and hell has been guided by sources that are not the Bible, right? Uh, probably the number one source that people look to for information about heaven and hell for the last, you know, several hundred years is Milton in Paradise Lost, which he got some information from the Bible, but then he just made a bunch of stuff up, right? Um, and so you, you, we can't really look at that. And so I, I like to talk instead about what the scripture actually says about heaven and hell and, and what it says about our future. And when it talks about heaven, the Bible has three different ways of talking about heaven. It uses the word heaven in three different ways. And there were the first, second, and third heaven. So first heaven is the place where the birds fly, right? It's the sky. The second heaven is the place where the stars shine. That's, that's space. And third heaven is the place where God sits on his throne. That's the celestial realm. That's the, the spiritual realm where God is in control. It's, we see pictures of it in scripture where Isaiah goes and he stands in the presence of God in spirit. And, and he sees angels going back and forth to the throne of the Lord, holding hot coal, singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We see a picture of it when Paul says that he was transported to the third heaven, right? That, that's the third heaven. Then there's the idea of hell. And I think the clearest picture we have of hell is what Jesus calls hell. And he uses a word for hell called Gehenna. And Gehenna was a, a space where, it, where Israelites burned their trash. And so when, when Jesus refers to hell, he calls it literally a dumpster fire. And I just love that dumpster fire has become a term that's used in culture today. Like you might look at the, you know, the uh, Texans and be like, man, that, the Texans have just become a dumpster fire. Well, that's like a figurative dumpster fire. What he said, he talks about hell, he's like, it's literally a place where the trash is taken out and it is destroyed piece by piece slowly in fire. And so that's the picture of heaven and hell, the place of where God reigns 
and, and where judgment is, is carried out. But, but what we have to look forward to, and Jesus is very clear about this, is that we have to look forward to eternal life. In particular, that we have to look forward to the resurrection from the dead. Now this is one of those things that we see not just in our scriptures, but we see it around the world. One of the questions that I've gotten in the past couple of weeks is what do I think the influence of foreign religion is on Christianity? And, and my answer is zero. I don't see there being influence of foreign religion, except for maybe you know a, a small holiday here and there. But here's what I see. I see that the scriptures tell me in Romans that, that as Paul's writing about the world and the testimony of God to the world, he says that all of the world has witnessed God's creation. And, and through that, we see that God has given sort of this common grace to all of the world. Pretty much anywhere you go in the world, there are people who have a sense of what is right and what is wrong. No matter what country, no matter what continent, there are people who know right from wrong. Well, that's, that's the way that God has put it inside of us that we know that we are supposed to care about the people who live next door to us that we're supposed to have a relationship with him. Even without Jesus saying it, even without the Old Testament saying it again and again, we are born with the sense that we're supposed to love our neighbor. We're not supposed to hack them to bits, right? That's not, that's not for us, that's wrong, that's evil. It's good to love our neighbors, that's common around the world. Now, God made it more specific than that. In fact, he made it more specific than that and so that you see themes that are found in the Bible in the cultural stories and myths around the world. In fact, if, it doesn't matter if you look at Egyptian culture and mythology, Babylonians, the Zoroastrians, Hinduism, Buddhism, ancient Greek mythology, you look at any ancient mythology and you'll see a lot of similarities where they say that the world was created by God or gods and that at some point the gods grew frustrated with their creation and they recognized that creation had to be redeemed. And not only that, but that all of creation could only be redeemed, not by themselves, but by God coming to earth and dying for the creation. Like that's the picture everywhere. When C.S. Lewis talks about this in Mere Christianity, he calls this good dreams. He says that that around the world, God has put it in our hearts that we understand what is right and what's wrong. And not only that, but you know, Solomon, when he was writing, he says that God has placed eternity in the hearts of men, but that we don't understand it. What C.S. Lewis is saying is he's saying that we have this sense of what God is doing in humanity, what he is doing with his creation. But God didn't leave it just at good dreams where we could sort of make these mythologies but he's, instead, he very specifically chose one family. And it was a really small family. In fact, the, about the smallest family you could have, he chose a man and his wife who were barren, no children. And he said, I will make you my people. And I, if I was Abraham, I'd be like, wait, just, just the two of us? Like God's people, it's just gonna be us? Just like both of us as God's people? He says, yes, the two of you, I will make you a people, you will, you will be my people, I will be your God. And through this smallest possible family, through this, what would become a very um, growing family, especially when you get to Jacob and all his boys, right? He, he claims this one family, this one people for his own. And he says, I'm not going to just leave the world with these good dreams. I'm going to give them the very concrete truth. I'm going to use this one family and I'm going to show my might. I'm going to show my love. I'm going to show my judgment through this one family. And out of this one family, I'll bring the redemption for all people. And that redemption, the apex, the zenith of that redemption will come when my son does the impossible. When my son becomes the one born of death who returns to life. When my son is resurrected from the dead, then everything will be different. It's going to change everything, not just through a good dream from some other culture, but through the actual event of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And so we see resurrection in many different cultures, 
But those are, are not, it is not, a cultural anthropologist looks at those and says, well, this culture had to have interacted with this culture because they have similar myths. No, 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 no. The cultural anthropology doesn't understand the notion that there is one God over all of the world, and he is sending his message of love to all of his children, just to varying degrees. And so, yeah, the stories are going to be a lot alike because it's, they've got the same author, if I have the same author, God is telling his truth to his children. And so you'll see echoes of themes of Christianity and other religions. I think probably the clearest is the motif of the understanding of the resurrection. I think that resurrection is, is especially becoming more, um, more of a thing that the world recognizes. I don't know if you've watched any horror movies lately, you know, but one of the things that in the last couple of decades, especially in the last few years, one of the big sort of movie uh, crazes has been the zombie, right? The zombie. We, we have the walking dead and the fear of the walking dead and the night of the living dead. It, you know, it's just like horror movies and not just American horror movies. Around the world, people are making these zombie movies and, they're, and I'll tell you why they're scary. It's not just scary because you're being chased by monsters. Those movies are scary because what they've done is they've taken what all of humanity knows is right, resurrection, and they bring a corruption to it, and that's scary. But I think maybe my, my personal favorite example of how resurrection is seen across the world comes in the, uh, oh, I want to make sure I say this right, Kikubaka. Kikubaka tombs in Okinawa, which is a, an island off the southern islands of Japan. It's this tiny little island, and in Okinawa they have tombs that are shaped like a woman giving birth. Now, this is a, an audience with children, adults, everybody, so I'm gonna leave it at that. All right, and I'll let you use your imaginations and Google later to examine what a Kikubaka tomb looks like. But it looks like a woman who is giving birth, and in their culture, they put their dead bodies into this tomb that is shaped like a woman giving birth with the understanding that one day those dead people are gonna come out of that tomb because they will be born again. Now that isn't the influence of Christianity, that isn't the influence of Judaism or any other form of it. That is, that is their good dream that they put into practice through the way that they honor and respect their dead. God has put this out into the culture. And so when we talk about our eternity, I think it's most exact to say that we're not just looking forward to heaven, we're looking forward to resurrection. Because a promise is for eternal life. Daniel, and we see it, here's some examples in the, just in the Old Testament. So that, and I want, I'm telling you this because sometimes people say, oh, the resurrection is a New Testament creation. It's not. Daniel chapter 12, verse two says, those who sleep in the dust will awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting contempt. Isaiah 26, 19 says, your dead will live, their bodies will rise. You who dwell in the dust will awake and sing. Psalm 49, 15 says, God will ransom my soul from Sheol or the grave. Psalm 16, 10, you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. Psalm 71, 20, you who have made me see many troubles and calamities will revive me again from the depths of the earth. You will bring me up. And I think maybe the first one is Genesis 13, 15, where he says to Abraham, all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I have to put emphasis on that because a lot of people miss that. I will give it to you and your offspring forever. Not Abraham, all the land that you see, I'm going to give to you for the next couple of years and then you're going to die and then your kids are going to get it and they'll have it for a couple of generations and then they're going to have to leave it. They're going to go and find sanctuary in Egypt and then they're going to become slaves and then they're going to wander in the desert and then they're going to sort of get it back but they're going to have to really struggle for it and they're going to be constantly subject to outside invasion and then eventually they'll establish a monarchy that's going to have its highs and its lows but eventually the monarchy is going to be split in two and half of it's going to be taken off and destroyed absolutely. Half of it's going to be taken off into slavery. Eventually they'll be brought back but they'll always be under the boot of the Greeks or the Romans or somebody until eventually the Romans destroy them and then two, two believers Millennia later, the United Nations is going to give them their nation back. I mean, if God wanted to say that, he knows all those words. He could have said that. But that's not what he says. He says, I will, a future event, give you and your children together the land forever. That's resurrection, my friends. 
That's a promise of resurrection, that there will be a point in the future where Abraham and all of his descendants will be brought back to a physical life and they will be inheritors of the promise of the land forever. And when Abraham considered his descendants, when he considered his children, knowing that he had himself had only sired two, God says, no, your descendants aren't just these two boys. Look to the stars. Those stars, your descendants will be as numerous as they. And one of those stars was lit for you. One of those stars was lit for me because we, as inheritors, inheritors of the gospel, are heirs to the promise of Abraham. And it's not just that we're gonna sit on a cloud with a harp like little babies with wings. It's not that we're gonna go one day and we're gonna see George Burns in heaven or Morgan Freeman, next generation, right? That's not the promise. The promise is that we will be brought back to life, to live here eternally. That we'll have a life like the Garden of Eden, except before the sin. Now, I'm not, I'm not from this part of the world, and so I don't know. Is it, is, it a, is it okay to make jokes about Cajuns? Is that okay? I saw one this week that said, you know, if Adam and Eve, it said, you know Adam and Eve weren't Cajun, because if they had been, they would have forgotten about the apple and eaten the snake. <laughs> I wasn't entirely sure I understood the joke, but I think I get it. Um, right, but Adam and Eve, that's the picture of what our reality will be. It will be, how is, how is the Garden of Eden described? Paradise, minus the snake, right? It, it's paradise. And when Jesus is talking to the thief on the cross, he says, today you'll be with me. Paradise. Like that's, that's the resurrection. It's not a cloud. It's not being up in the sky. It's being alive again to live eternally. Now, let me go back. What happens before that? Well, before our eternal state as resurrected inheritors of the promise, before that, this is what Hebrews chapter nine says. It says, it is appointed unto man once to die and after that, the judgment. Now, in the scriptures, it is very clear that part of our eternal destination requires judgment. Now, there are 12 different judgments in scripture and I am not going to cover all of them because five of them have already passed, two of them are ongoing and there are five judgments that are for a future time and we see those in the book of Revelation. We see that there are five judgments that are coming. Now, you and I can have different perspectives on those five judgments as to exactly how many they are or exactly when they'll happen or if some of them are symbolic or some of them kind of figurative or some of, are they all literal? We can disagree about that and still be friends. Like you and I can have very different perspectives on that and we can still love each other. We can still serve our neighbors together. We can still do missions together. We can worship the Lord together. And I'm just gonna say like, if, if you don't get anything else out of this message, but the fact that in 2018, people can disagree and still love each other. Oh, good, good news, right? We can still, we can disagree and we can still care for each other. This is one of those things we can disagree about. But I think, I think it should suffice for us now to just say, that after we die, there will come a judgment. There will come a judgment, and before that judgment, there is a, um, an intermediate state. There is something between death and judgment. Now, I'm gonna call it the intermediate state. Other religions, other denominations, will call that intermediate state some different things. And I shy away from using that terminology again because it's loaded with a lot of meaning. And, and some of the meaning isn't, isn't biblical, all right? So like one of the terminology, one of the pieces of terminology that's used is, is purgatory. And the idea of purgatory is that after you die, you go to a place that's neither heaven nor hell, but it's a place where all people are subjected to a certain level of trial or torment until the last of their, their sins is washed away. Um, the teaching of purgatory says that you can pray for your family members who are in purgatory, that they can get out. It, it says that you can, even, you can even pay for your sins, like literally pay money for your sins to the church now so that those sins won't be held against you later. 
And if you're opening your Bible looking for that, you're not going to find that, right? It's, it's not there. It's not a biblical teaching. And so that was rejected as, as what is a, a theologically sound um, position for us hundreds of years ago during the Protestant Reformation, all right? Men like Martin Luther and Zwingli and John Calvin said, no, that's, that's not it. That's not the Bible. That's not what the Bible teaches. And they had a lot of other grievances against the Roman Catholic Church, and so they split. Let me give you, let me give you like two minutes on the Protestant Reformation, which took about 100 years for them to actually live out in real time. I'm going to give you like the two-minute version. They saw a lot of problems with, with the church and with what the church was practicing, and so instead of just saying, well, I'm just not going to go to church, they said, I'm going to look to the Bible, to the Scripture, as the source of authority in my life and for, the, for what we practice in church. And in doing that, they rediscovered a lot of things that had sort of been left along the way. One of the things was they discovered that this purgatory thing is, is not a way, really good way to describe the intermediate state between death and, and final judgment. And so they, they did away with that. And so they, they did away with a lot of other things. And then they fought a lot of wars and a lot of people died to try and figure out who should have authority in the church and who should have to pay money to who and all of that. And when all the dust was settled, the question that was put to me was, are Baptists a part of the Reformation? Yeah, sort of. Because during all of that, that violence and opposition to each other, our, the Baptist church, the Baptist ideology sort of sprung out of that. And, and there is a uh, several hundred years you can see Baptists practicing very close to the, the faith that we practice today, springing out of Europe and then today going around the world, Baptist practicing. And so are we a part of the Reformation? Yes, in a general sense. Now, more specifically, would you call the Baptist church a reformed church? Now, here's where it gets really tricky. Because the word reforms in particular means that we would hold to Calvinistic doctrine, which is sort of this idea of predestination, right? Now, are we reformed? Some people are, and some Baptists aren't. And yay, 2018, we can disagree. You can stand and say, I believe in Calvinism. I think that, uh, I, don't, I don't just believe in the five points of Calvinism. I've made up a sixth point of Calvinism and I'll fight you about that. No, we're not gonna fight. We won't have to fight about that. You and I, we can disagree about those sort of uh, philosophical underpinnings of our faith. So are Baptists out of the Reformation? Yes, are we reformed? Not all. Some are, some aren't. And that's okay. We can still serve the Lord together. Now, let me get back to, to purgatory. <laughs> um, so purgatory, this idea of this place of waiting for the dead is seen around the world. It's another one of those good dreams that God sent out to his people. But I think what we see, the best answer I can give to that intermediate state is from the scriptures. And I think the first thing that we see, I think the most important thing that we need to understand about what it is that happens after we die, but before the judgment, comes from 2 Corinthians 5, 8, where Paul says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So if you, if you have a loved one who has passed away, you can understand that they are absent in the body but they are present with the Lord. Now, that should be a comfort. If the, your loved one loved the Lord, that should be a comfort that they're with someone that they absolutely loved. So they're present with the Lord, but the scriptures don't just leave us with that. They get a little bit more specific in the idea that they talk throughout the Old Testament about Sheol, which Sheol is sometimes it's called just simply the grave or the place of the dead. But Sheol, it, it's a little bit more than just the grave. It doesn't just mean the hole in the ground, right? Because it's, it's considered a place of comfort, a place of rest, a place of peace. Throughout the Old Testament, we see it described that way. In fact, it is, it is a place that when David's son his infant child dies. David is, is weeping and mourning. Well, not mourning. He's weeping and he's petitioning the Lord to save his son. And when his son passes away, David immediately stops his, his you know, takes off the sackcloth and ashes. He washes his face. He goes and gets something to eat. He stops fasting. And people says, but your son's dead. Why aren't you mourning? And he says, well, because I don't need to mourn anymore. Because my son has gone to a place and he's not coming back to me but I'm going to go to him, and he's glad about it. It isn't just, well, he's in the ground now, and so I will be too. It's my son has gone on to something better than this, and one day 
I'll go to him as well. Another picture that we get from this is Abraham's bosom. Now let me start with paradise. Jesus calls it paradise, right? That it's, that this, it's this beautiful place. And so we see that it is a place where God is present. It is a place of peace. It is a place like paradise. And I think the fourth would be that it is called Abraham's bosom. And here I think a really great picture of that comes in Luke chapter 16. Now Jesus didn't invent this idea of Abraham's bosom. That has been around for a long time. Rabbis had been teaching about Abraham's bosom for a while, and it was their understanding. Now, I need to do one thing. Let me clarify something. Hey, Baylor, come here real quick, baby. So, Abraham, yeah, come on. What is and is not Abraham's bosom? Because it's a, it's a weird expression. I'm just going to say that. Um, there you go. No, that wasn't embarrassing at all. Here we go. All right. So, right here, this is a picture of what Abraham's bosom is supposed to look like. Right? It's, it's this. It's that you go and you sit in your father's lap. And naturally, when you're in your father's lap, your head goes right here to his chest. This is it. Is it okay if I go back to my sermon now? Okay, you can head back down. So that's it. I don't know about you, but I like that. And not just as a father. I like the idea that, that when I leave this world, that I'm gonna go to a place that will feel like my dad's lap. I like the idea that one day I'll leave here and I will go to the place where in this life I felt safer than anywhere else. I'm gonna go to a place where I felt more love and comfort probably than I, I would ever, ever know, right? That's, that's the place where I'm going. And when Jesus describes it in Luke 16, he describes it in the context of this rich man and a poor man named Lazarus. In verse 19, he says, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. At his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's Side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being tormented, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side, and he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner had bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. So that is the picture. Now, that is Lazarus and the rich man being in roughly the same place, separated by something, but able that some sort of communication is able to move across them. So how is it that two people can be in the same place and have such different experiences? Now this is a, a crude analogy, but it's the best one I've come up with in the last like 20 years. And, and it's this, that two people can have the same, same situation and experience it very differently. My nephew, no, my brother-in-law, Jordan, is 25 years old, and he's single, ladies. Um, he's, he's single, and he's a 25-year-old man, and if he was trapped in an elevator with a 25-year-old woman who was intelligent and kind and beautiful, and he was trapped in that elevator, he would probably see that as a good thing. Right? He would be able to have a captive audience to, with this you know, intelligent, attractive 25-year-old woman, and, and he would be able to you know, walk up to her and be like, uh, hey, uh, you come here often? I, I don't know. Uh, or, You're the bee's knees. I have no idea what his rap would be like. Uh, but he would be able to talk to her, and it would be for him. And can you imagine their story later on in life, right? How'd you two meet? Well, <laughs> he, he messed up an elevator, and so we were trapped together for three hours, right? Now that for him might be a great situation, 
But if you switched him and me out, and I was trapped in an elevator with an intelligent, beautiful 25-year-old woman, I'm gonna say this and be like, I don't mean to be rude, miss, but until we get out of here, I'm gonna have my nose in this corner and I'm not gonna talk to you at all. And then I'm gonna go to the corner of the elevator, I'm gonna call my wife, I know, better yet, I'm gonna FaceTime my wife and be like, honey, listen, I'm, I'm in this elevator and you know what, I wish that I was trapped in this elevator with you because there's no one I would rather be trapped in an elevator with than you. Oh, her, I don't know her, right? Like, for me, that situation would be, it'd be hellish. For someone else, it might be paradise. And so two people, can have the same particulars of their situation and their experience in it will be completely different. Last year, two evangelists died. Last year, last fall into winter, two evangelists died within just a short time of each other. One evangelist was the Reverend Billy Graham. He died, he left this world, he entered into his reward. I believe that he went into a place of paradise, that, that Billy Graham went and he took his seat in Abraham's lap, and that Abraham patted Billy Graham on the head and said, boy, you sure added a lot of people to our family, and that he was overjoyed. The second evangelist that died last year was an evangelist named Stephen Hawking. Now, Billy Graham taught the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stephen Hawking preached a gospel without good news. He, he taught and preached a story of creation that had no creator. He preached a history of events that had no his to the story. He preached a message that led countless thousands away from a belief in a God that loves them and cares for them. And I have to imagine that when Stephen Hawking walked into eternity, that he said, no because he would have immediately recognized that everything he believed, everything he taught, all of the people that he misled, that that judgment that is coming is coming for him. And so whether or not there are physical flames there or just mental torment there, he's in it. Because he knows what's coming. Now that's the intermediate state. But before we get to that, before we get to that state, there's one more question that I think is important to answer. The question is asked, will God, do you believe that God will really send people to hell? Now, I'm gonna break this question down a little bit, and the question is, do I think God wants to? No. I think the scriptures are very clear that God isn't just being slow, that he's being patient because he desires for all humanity to come to know him, that he doesn't want to see anyone suffer or perish that fate, but he instead wants to see all of them redeemed. So I think that's his desire. Do I think though that, that there will be people who go to hell, to everlasting destruction? Yes, yes I do, but I don't think that he's going to, I don't think it's fair to say that he's going to send people there. That'd be like saying that the police and the judges have given people a prison sentence. Well. Those people earned it. And let's not make a mistake about it. There aren't people in this world aren't just accidentally tripping and falling into hell. There are a lot of people in this world who are very actively running. They are racing towards hell. Like in, in spite of any warning that they may be given, they pursue a course that only goes in one direction. Hell. They're running after it. Now, my goal as I share the gospel, as I spread the good news of what Jesus has done for us, is I don't wanna see anybody able to f trip and fall into hell. I don't want anybody even to be able to run into hell, and here's how. If somebody is, that I know is going to go into hell, here's how they're gonna go. They're gonna go by crawling over the broken and bloody body of Jesus Christ. I'm gonna make sure that before they go to that eternal destination, that they know that they are doing it over the broken body of a God who died for them, who is grasping for them, who is clinging to them, saying, don't, don't go. When they arrive at the gates of hell, I want them to know that they are covered by the sweat of Jesus' effort to save them, that they are covered by the gore of his death to save them, that they are covered in his hope that they rejected. I don't wanna see anybody fall 
or even run into hell. But that, that brings us to today. That brings us to today. And see, the, the issue for us is what will happen today. At the end of that passage in, in Luke, the man, the rich man, cries out to Abraham, will send someone to tell my brothers and someone to tell my brothers, because I've got these brothers and they need to know. And Abraham says, they've got the prophets, they've got the Old Testament, they've got the teachings, the scriptures. They know the truth. And he says, but they're not going to believe that. And Abraham says, it doesn't matter. Even if somebody returns from the dead, they wouldn't believe them either. And what we see in our world is that there are a lot of people who don't. But here's the truth that the world needs. The truth that the world needs is that you and I have sinned. And as Romans 3.23 would say that our sins have caused us to fall short of God's glory, that, that we cannot earn our way into heaven, paradise, the resurrection to eternal life, that that's not something that we earn, but that God in, in his love for us, that he showed that love by sending his son to die for us while we were covered in sin. And that, and that we have the chance to place the wages of our sin on Jesus' shoulders and that we have the chance to put the gift of his eternal life onto ours. Don't don't leave here today unsure. Don't leave here today unsure about where your eternal destination is. Don't leave here today wondering, well, I don't know. No, we've got a great testimony from his word about what our options are. The question is, is is what decision are you going to make about it? Let's pray together. Our most gracious Father, we thank you for today. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you did not leave us in this despairing place, but that you sent your son to die for us. Lord, I pray that if there is any here who's who's never made that decision to follow after you, to commit their life to you, pray that your spirit would move in their heart today that they would say, today I want to know my eternal destination. Lord, for those of us who maybe we have people in our lives that we look at them and we say, Lord, they're just running. They're running a race that only ends in one place. Lord, let us put you in their path. Let us put up a a cross-shaped roadblock in their path to say, you may may go to hell, but you will only do so tripping over the body of my Savior. Savior. Let us be bold in our efforts to tell people your truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me for a time of invitation.